Good evening and welcome to Greater Somerville. I'm Kyan Anderson. Tonight's topic, the Somerville Zoning Overhaul. What is it, why it's important, and how critical it is for the community to understand the ways in which this document may change the future fabric of Somerville significantly, if approved by the Board of Aldermen in, in the upcoming weeks. My guest tonight is no stranger to this topic. As, as the Director of Planning for the City of Somerville since 2010, he's been the driving force behind this Herculean effort for the past 24 months. He's here tonight to help us walk through this, the concept of this zoning document, answer my compiled list of community questions, and remind us of the important public hearing that's coming next Tuesday, February 10th, at 6 p.m. at City Hall. So please join me in welcoming, for his return appearance here on Greater Somerville, George Proakis to the show. Thank you. Welcome to the show. It's good to be here. I can't believe you made it in all the snow. I was... Um, mm -hmm. As a little bit of a tidbit here, we are pre-recording this episode um, because the snow was just so bad we got canceled yesterday. So I appreciate you making the, the haul. Sure. <laughs> good, 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 good to be here. Any, any, anything uh, for zoning, right, George? I will say zoning has been a Herculean effort, but probably not as much as clearing the snow in the city. Yeah, yeah, exactly. For at least for the, for the last couple of, uh, couple of days anyway. Um, days, but it's, it's moving forward, certainly. Yeah, and so is zoning, and which we're here. Um, so. I really wanted to do this episode because George has, um, he's been making the rounds on all the talk shows actually, um, really trying to promote the zoning overhaul and, and, and getting people involved and having their comments. So tonight, we're really gonna just do the format pretty simply. Um, I'm not gonna go into George's background because we all know George Perikis. He's been here since 2010 and is doing an amazing job. Um, but what we are gonna do is we're gonna take about 10 minutes to go over the general zoning. How did we get here? Um, the old zoning and the new zoning and the maps and just kind of for you at home who may not be aware of what's all going on here. And then what we'll do then is we'll go through a series of questions that will touch upon a lot of the hot topics that I think I've been hearing in the community and I've compiled. And then George will um, respond as how they pertain to the zoning. And then we'll wrap up. Sure. Does that sound good? So uh, I'm going to go ahead, go ahead and, and, and put on the slides because we're tech savvy like that here at Greater Somerville. And then sure. you just kind of explain a little bit about uh, what we're seeing here. Okay. Um, so... Um a little bit of an introduction to the zoning overhaul and um, the program we're doing here. Um, the zoning overhaul project has been based primarily on implementing over a hundred goals of the Summer Vision Comprehensive Plan. Summer Vision project we started in 2009 and completed in 2010 based upon the idea of collecting the community's values. The word cloud here has always been a description of some of those values. Most significantly, Summer Vision is a um, plan for growth that is also a plan for neighborhood conservation. Talks about creating 30,000 new jobs and 6,000 new housing units, and we've now begun conversations about even looking at more than that um, to address the regional housing needs. Um, at the same time, ensuring that 85% of new development is in areas mapped on, marked on our summer vision map as transitional area areas, um, while at the same time conserving our, our neighborhoods. So the idea is the areas in green on the map are neighborhoods that um, stay mainly as they are, while the areas in yellow, Assembly Square, Inner Belt, Brick Bottom, Boynton Yards, and the southern end of Union Square can undergo significant change and really handle the growth that is the future of Somerville. Meanwhile, we enhance the areas in between the corridors and, and the community squares like Ball Square, Golden Square. And it's just important, and I'm going to jump in here, George, sure. for a second, is that those circles, the blue circles, are representative of the new Green Line T stations. At least um, five of them are. Yes, five of them are. Some are the existing Red Line stations yep. as well at Davis and Porter. Can have a little bit more um, development. Yes. Okay, right. perfect. Um, so at the same time as all this change has been occurring with the T and technology's changed and Somerville's changed, um, our zoning code um, hasn't changed much. It, it, we've made some changes five years ago, but we've cobbled them onto a document that was a state-of-the-art document for 1990 when it was last overhauled. So put that into some perspective when we think about what that means, state of the art for 1990, like to remind people <laughs> that the, um, yeah, the, um, floppy, the, disk. the floppy disk and the cell that. phone were just about um, the popular way of looking at the world at that point, but between, between our technology and our perspective, things have changed significantly since that time, and it's time to take another look. But we can go even a step beyond that. The, uh, the map, the existing zoning map, and some, some work that was done five years ago in, um, in Broadway and in Union Square, but at the same time also includes residential districts that were um, were divided with division lines that were created in the 1920s when our original zoning ordinance was done. 
So, you know, we've looked at all of that and we've tried to address those. I mean, in 2012, we issued the report, the Residence A and Residence B district reports with all sorts of data about the similarities and differences between the residential districts. There's been a lot of prep work for this, and in preparation, we have now put together and submitted to the Board of Aldermen um, a new code overhaul, which also includes a new zoning map. And the new zoning map is focused on implementing the goals of summer vision. Um, and I'm sure that particular map is a little tough to read, but we can dive in a little bit more detail into kind of what's what. And just to kind of dissect a little bit for the people that are completely not zoning, I mean, you are always in zoning, so you're very familiar with this. But in terms of just generally looking at a map of a city and saying, okay, you know, what are the areas that are going to be more dense? For example, Union Square or the Assembly Row area that could handle a higher building or a, a more of an urban kind of a, a transit oriented development. Yeah, I mean, the areas kind of pop out where things are going on. That gray background color is the neighborhood residence district, which is designed to protect the neighborhood of single, two, three family mm -hmm. houses that are typical of Somerville. And uh, the, uh, the, the inner belt has a special district, brick bottom is a special district, assembly square remains the way it is, the, and then some of the squares where the oranges are and some of the purples are, there's a little bit more intensity of development, and that's, that's kind of the balance. Okay, and, and we're going to get into this a little bit more later in the show, but I mean, I think it's important for anyone at home, if you live anywhere near any of these squares, if, even if you're not a, a zoning code expert like George, I think it's really important for you to take a look at where you're living and look at the color that's around where you're living and say, okay, is this concern you? Is it not? Are you comfortable with it? Because there is so much information going on in this one map. And all of this, um, this map, as well as the entire pr uh, proposal uh, that you've given to the Board of Aldermen, is available online um, and can be commented on ongoing. Maybe I'll switch to the next slide here. We'll get back to that slide in a moment. But yes. I, Oh, sorry. No, sure, and, and I'm happy to talk a little bit more about how we're collecting comments as well. Um, but I want to focus on uh, the overall objectives of the code. For, um, um, top piece of this is providing better customer service and, and access to open government. It's um, transparency. Transparency. The code we have today is, is, is not very easy for the public to understand. We're trying to make it easier. It's more graphical. It's better organized. And at the same time, we're strengthening protection for residential neighborhoods. Right now, people can... People want to put a dormer in their house and people who want to stick an eightplex in the lot next door to you, you go through the same process. We're changing that to create something that's more consistent. Cutting red tape for small businesses at the same time is trying to work on industrial areas. And we have some special stuff for the arts and maker space that we can get into in a moment. Oh. Um, so a little more spe specificity on this. Um, you know, we're, we're trying to create an understandable set of maps and districts like our, our Commercial districts are called three-story mixed-use, four-story mixed, five-story mixed-use. Five mixed the size of buildings in those districts are very easy to understand by the name of the district. Mm -hmm. um, reflecting Somerville's DNA and based upon building types, our, our residential districts are, um, we did a lot of measuring of what the sizes of shapes of houses are, kind of how tall they are, how far yep. back they are, how front porches look, and how those work, and have tried to create diagrams. The whole code is based upon a series of building type diagrams work in different districts. And kit of parts, if you will, so people can yeah. come in and be like, okay, this exactly. works in my neighborhood. And then the first thing is that we have this idea that you can put modest additions on houses. The kind of additions that homeowners want to put as you grow a family or kind of grow and change your house from a small rear addition to a modest sized dormer to adding a front porch to a house that doesn't yeah. have one to adding a back deck. A lot of these things right now involve a trip to the Zoning Board of Appeals, the new code. If you do them within a certain reasonable size, you can do them by going in and getting a building permit. And that skips out a lot of time and effort by the city it or and the, and the few, homeowner as well. Quite a few months and quite a lot okay. of money on the homeowner's behalf. Okay, additionally. Okay. So going on to the arts account and the creative economy, we're creating something called fabrication district for places, um, building types for artists, like um, we have down where Artisan's Asylum is or places like where um, Vernon Street, Studio. where Vernon Street yep. Studios are. Um, it also, in addition to creating that special district, it allows people to use carriage houses um, for homes for studio space as, as well as do in-home studios. Um, the kind of carriage house rear garages have never been able to be used for anything other than storage yeah, before, great, so yeah. it's a great spot for the arts. Um, existing civic and institutional buildings that are in residential districts can convert to arts uses. Um, and also where we get into the big transformational districts, um, mm -hmm. carries forward an idea that started with the unions going five, five years ago that 5% of the floor area would be for creative, creative and arts type. Oh, uses. I like that. Okay. Yeah. Um, it, it, it has some of the most aggressive affordable housing requirements in the country. Um, projects that have seven or more, more units are required to have affordable housing. Right now, much of the city requires one out of eight 
every eight units to be affordable. It moves many of the districts to as, as many as one in five. Um, it creates a middle income category to capture the group that's between not qualifying for current subsidized housing and not being able to afford mm -hmm. current market rate housing. Um, and also reduces parking relative to transit, which is a, a big expense in development, which affects housing affordability, especially in places where people aren't using yeah. the, dra the, the parking spaces because they're using the transit. And why pay for it, yeah. Yeah. Um, and then the real, there's a real focus here on the economy. I mean, the 30,000 jobs is a big piece of this. Um, one of the th things we've done is a lot of the uses, right now we have over 200 uses in the code. Um, it brings it down to about 100. It, um, it, a lot of the small business uses don't require special permits. Um, they, can, they can go in and change out a small business in a neighborhood business district um, by just getting a building permit. Um, it sets up a system for investing in transformational areas, and I think this is the most significant thing for an inner belt or a brick bottom. I can go into a little more detail about that in, in a bit. Um, and it, it also distinguishes between chain stores and small businesses. It does still bring the chain stores in for a uh, special permit. We spend a time at the zoning board and looking at making okay. sure they can fit the neighborhood. But there would never be an instance where a chain store would come in without a special permit, right? That's the idea. I wouldn't get like a McDonald's in my backyard. You would, I'm being you, facetious. Well, you would, get a, you would get a public <laughs> hearing to decide whether or not we want that. Okay, good, community. good, good, that, good. We'd, pro we'd be protected. That's perfect. Right. Um, so really important. There's a lot of opportunity for feedback on this. For us, the most significant thing is we've created this website, somervillema.gov slash zoning. It's a very easy yep, extension I went to it. city website. Mm -hmm. um, we have the entire code up there. You can download the code. 312 pages, copies. folks. I went through yes. it. Well, the old one's over 400, so we oh, we've goodness. some progress. Oh, wow. Um, yes. <laughs> God. <laughs> we, uh, we, we have the, so the code is there. We have a, ver a program called Markup, which we um, we are, I believe, only the second community in the country to use, where you can actually go in and mark comments on, on sections. And you can see people's like. comments, which was right. great for me. And the comments I was are there, and, and you, if you don't like someone else's comment or you like someone else's comment, you can write you agree or you disagree. But you or can't or erase someone's, right? Not erase oh, someone's darn it. comment, no. Don't go um, in there, George. You know, as long as they, they follow a reasonable set of rules, we're going to leave them all up no. there. We, we want to, uh, we, we need the feedback. We're hoping to engage in an online conversation about the code, have but, people express their concerns through that. And more importantly is this upcoming public hearing next Tuesday, February 10th at 6 o'clock in the Aldermanic Chambers in City Hall on Highland Avenue. I think um, that's more of a, well it's yeah. not online, but people can go there and voice, as well as if people have, you were saying, you can submit, if you have a question on your property, um, you, can, you can submit it like and they can change, the right? Yes. Yes. You can do all, all those things. We're, look, we, our staff spent an amazing amount of time working on this map and trying to get all the different yep. pieces of it right. But um, there were just circumstances in the neighborhood that we can't necessarily know about as we're putting the map together. And, and that's that, where we're looking for some feedback. Feedback from the community, which we is a wonderful. We set up a system where, yeah, if you think the zoning on your lot or even one of your neighbor's yeah. lots yeah. or one of the lots in the local business district is mm -hmm. wrong for some reason, um, you go in, you fill out a form online, you push a button, every one of those forms we're going to take to the planning board, we're going to take to the Board of Aldermen as we go through this process. Yep. Probably, not not in February 10th, but in one of the later meetings, we're going to keep that open okay. for a while longer. We're going to keep on getting... Comments are available. You can add comments for a while. You're yeah, trying to yeah. get this done in a quick amount of time, right? Well, the goal. You know, no, I, I, I mean, I don't know. This, this is, this is the board of aldermen's process at this point. I mean, they have to take the time to do the due diligence and they need approve to do, it, finish yep. it, and approve it. Okay. I mean, there's, there's some statutory requirements. After they close a public hearing, um, they're supposed to act within 90 days. Which, if they keep it open, the time they typically do, we probably close the hearing sometime in the late spring, okay. early summer time, time frame. Yeah. But, you know, we, we want to make sure we get it we, yeah. we get it right. A lot of details in this. But you know what? You have opportunities to yeah. voice your opinion if you want to be heard. And we want to um, collect those comments and, and, and work with the Board of Aldermen to create edits to this thing to make it yeah. better based upon those comments. Okay. That was impressive. I told George he had to do his spiel in 10 minutes, and you are almost... You're a little bit over, but that's okay. I'm impressed. A lot of information. We want you to hold on because realistically, you know, people are at home going, wow, there's so much here. It's daunting. But I do think there are certain key points um, within this zoning overhaul document that really I just want to talk with you because I've compiled a little bit of list of questions. So, and then we'll probably touch on some of the things that we just went over. Um, so one of the things that you mentioned is parking. It's like parking, yes. parking, parking is always the question. Yes. But then adversely, like, or in Somerville rather, it's a lot of bicycle, you know, because one of the goals of Summer Vision is to say 50%, uh, you want 50% of the trips to be uh, transit, walking, or biking. That is one of the Summer Vision goals. Okay, so now I have a question for you. Yes. Um, 
So I, I applaud that there is a reduction in the parking uh, ratio around transit-oriented development where people are less likely to be using their cars. Yep. So overall, there is a 60% reduction of parking, which is fantastic in those areas. Um, but there isn't a significant increase in the parking requirement. And I just thought that that was an interesting uh, thing. Mm -hmm. Well, just like the number of spaces that are required or, or even like the designated lanes. So you've got these collective, um, the complete streets, yes. right? There's not, there's a, there's no kind of definition of, okay, there has to be a bike lane here. And I'm curious as to why, if we're pushing that into the summer vision, you know, goal. Well, the, the, um, so there's a section on streets. The, there's a whole chapter on public realm that includes streets and kind of how streets work. Um, it's specific really for places where people are building new streets, which mm -hmm. doesn't happen often, but will probably be in places like Inner, Inner Belt or Boynton Yards as, as development happens there because we're trying to break up smaller scale buildings and smaller scale streets. Um, a lot of them end up being side streets. We've set the standards for kind of what our expectations are mm -hmm. there, but um, certainly that's an area that we are, that is continuing to evolve. I mean, we are committed to being one of, to, to, to remaining a top bike friendly city in yeah. the country. So um, anything we can do to try to make that And make it reflect us. more. Um, the bike par parking requirements were worked on. Um, we, we, we solicited a lot of help from the Somerville Bicycle Committee on mm -hmm. that. And they did a lot of research into uh, where bike parking, um, kind of what the what strategies communities have been, have been using that have been the best and took those best ideas and tried to package them into this regulation. Okay. So here's a question. Um, in terms of what we've been designating, you've been saying the, the, the three, four, five, and seven MU or mixed unit development. Yeah. Um, in terms of like FAR, yeah. um, are we kind of eliminating that? Is, is that? is that what this so, code does? Because FAR, for those that don't know, floor area ratio, it's a way of calculating the density on an actual lot in terms of the amount of floor area per like, the actual size of the lot. So, yeah, so floor area ratio is a very interesting term. It, 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 is, it was established in the 1960s in New York City to try to regulate the size of skyscrapers. Mm -hmm. It basically was designed to um, allow people to go taller if they created more open space and mm -hmm. kind of give them flexibility. Um, it works well in high-rise buildings. Um, it's been adopted in zoning codes throughout the country right down to residential neighborhood districts. Mm -hmm. It does really odd things when you start doing residential neighborhood districts. Um, my staff has compared FAR to um, handing somebody a can of Play-Doh for their lot and basically telling them you can mold it just about anything. Into a dinosaur. Lot. I watched yes, your TEDx thing. Dinosaur, yeah. yeah. So we, we moved from an FAR-based strategy to a building type-based strategy, which basically uses these building types to say, this is kind of the size and shape and type of building you can build on a lot. Mm -hmm. If your building gets too big, we expect you to slice your lot in half and build multiple buildings or, or kind of create more of a neighborhood. The idea is we're trying to build neighborhoods rather than just sort of use density metrics. Okay. And that's, that's the strategy. Okay. So it, along those lines, if we're talking about open space calculation. Okay. So one of the things that you mentioned in the summer vision, 125 acres has been deemed the target yes. that we're looking yes. for. Um, so have there been cal calculations? Because I... I'm just listening to a lot of kind of community kind of uh, concerns in terms of what calculations have actually been done to then account for, okay, these larger parcels of land, which we are expecting considerable development, like the inner belts, et cetera. Yes. Where does that, you know, where, how, how does one calculate that 125 acres? And is that within the realm of possibility? Um, so there's, there's two ways to work on open space. One is for the city to buy space as designated open space or to use space that's currently something else and make it into designated open space. The other, which, which is appealing to us in many circumstances because it, 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 it helps the development community contribute, is to request it as a community benefit. So, and have it be a part of a development project, but have it be publicly accessible. So in, in inner belt, one of the interesting things in inner belt or brick, brick bottom as a redevelopment district is that, that there's sort of a base allowance of development there that, that, that lets you kind of do the type of things that have been going on there mm -hmm. for years. If you want to do more significant development, if you, want, if you want to do any residential development, you have to come in with what we're calling a large development plan. Yeah. And the large development plan includes four community benefits that we expect out of every project. We expect commercial development as well as residential. Yep. We expect a significant amount of affordable housing. Um, we expect a um, um, the five percent arts use, and we expect on-site publicly accessible open space. Publicly accessible open publicly space. Accessible and, open and, space. And I ask yes. this question just because: yeah. uh, Is it true? Is his partners there? Are they proposing? Are they proposing publicly accessible open space for partners. the partners' building? Yes. 
They are. are. It is not a privately time. accessible. And I'm not. I'm yes. only saying this yes. because we worked on Maxwell's Green, yes. and that was supposed to be this big open space that utilized by our neighborhoods. And while it is open, it, it, it definitely is not. They did not promote that as a publicly well, open space. So, I just want to know that there's going to be some accountability, um, and, and specifically for something of that size. So yes. Yeah, so you so, know. I mean, Maxwell's Green, as well as Partners. Have, has the requirements on it that it that, that it be publicly accessible. They're 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 in, in all the legal agreements and all the deeds and everything like that. We, um, you know, we can continue to work on making sure that the publicly accessible open space works more for the public better and, and, and works in a way that, that makes a lot of sense. I mean, the, the um, but the partners place is publicly accessible open space. The um, okay. idea for each of the ones in a place like Intervelt is that they will they will be publicly accessible open space. We're looking, we're looking at the idea of whether or not in, in exchange for, in, instead of doing that, they mm -hmm. might be able to pay out so that we can sort of put something together to build Kind of like an open park. space development fund or something yeah. like that? that's a possibility as an alternative to providing it on site. So we're, yeah. we're having conversations. There's, I think I, I, we talked about putting pieces into the code that do that so that we could sort of build, build that opportunity. Yeah, 290 but, Highland doesn't have enough green space. I, and it's because of the nature of the site. And so that would be a wonderful opportunity for the developers to contribute. Um, so... All right, so there's the open space question. So one of the things I was going to talk about that you kind of touched on, the commercial residential ratio yes. and uh, protecting kind of de design diversity in these special districts. So in the larger mixed developments, um, there's often this requirement of having a ground level retail space with housing units above. And, you know, based on the city's extreme need to become a little more fiscally self-sufficient in terms of increasing in the commercial tech space, I'm curious as to how we are going to, I mean, we put these things in there as requirements or, I mean, how do we know that a, a large building of condos, albeit going after the 9,000 uh, units that uh, now has been said by the MAPC that we, you know, want to have in 2025, how do we know that that ratio of commercial, that we are not going to get just simple, you know, one story commercial uh, spaces and then the rest of it uh, be condos? You know, wh where yeah. is that commercial tech well, space going to come from, the, I guess? The, the my big question. step forward in this is is the strategy for special districts like Interbelt and Brick Bottom, which are the places which, the new places which we're opening up to transformational development to turn into building new neighborhoods. And it's important to us that our new neighborhoods can help us meet our summer vision goal of creating um, 30,000 new jobs. Um, and the way we've done that is we've said that when you put together a parcel of land to pursue one of our large development plans, a percentage of, um, a significant percentage of the development has to be commercial development. And unless you do that, you can't even do any residential development at all. In those okay, because it just so, seems really illogical if you're having like this push, like we really need to get more, I mean, I know that they're saying, so for those of you who don't know, the um, MAPC is, is Metropolitan, Oh my goodness, Planning Council? Area Planning Council. Pl area Planning Council, there you go. Yeah. And they basically came out. So Summer Vision said, we're going to do 6,000 units. That's what units of housing. The MAPC recently came out and said, no, 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 I want to do 9,000. We should do 9,000 because there's an overall regional shortage. And therefore, the city of Somerville said, okay, we're going to modify this new number to be 9,000. Of which the MAPC uh, noted that they were requesting 30% of that to be affordable housing. But the mayor had come back and said that 1,800 of those units would be affordable, which is about 20. Is that true? I, 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 I have not. I, I, what the mayor has said so far is he wants the Summer Vision Steering Committee to open up a discussion about okay. moving that number from 6,000 to 9,000. But it hasn't been... I don't think he's ever given the Summer Vision Committee a direct input from on his behalf of where he'd like the affordable housing number to go. Okay. Um, right now, the affordable housing number is 20% of the 6,000. 20 percent Okay. Yeah. Um, it's very it's 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 difficult in new development to request more than twenty percent as inclusionary housing mm -hmm. through through zoning. Yeah, there are other ways to get beyond that number involving like purpose built housing, like our housing authority builds or something like Somerville Community Corporation. Okay, so you could get the overall percentage higher than that, but but it becomes more tricky financially to do that. So we're looking at that. I mean, I mean the. the the overall shortage of housing in the region is over 400,000 units, and most people want to be for transit. But can I just ask a question, though? Yeah. If, 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 that's the, if that's the case, and there's the shortage of the housing, in my opinion, 
Somerville, well, not in my, it's, it's statistically, Somerville is one of the densest populations in the country. And part of me wants to look at the other communities. I'm not trying to say that Somerville won't help, but it's like, why are we getting, I, you know, because I, I definitely see there's a strategic advantage developmentally to say, okay, let's bring all these 9,000 units in here. And I'd like, to, I, as, a, as a, you know, taxpayer, looking at the infrastructure, you know, I know we're attracting a lot of the um, people that maybe don't have children yet, so maybe there, there are no need for schools right yet. We're hoping that changes with the larger units, but I mean, what is your well, thought on that? Because so I think, there's a few thoughts do we on, have to take in that? There's a few thoughts. I mean, for, first, first of all, uh, the mayor, one of the things the mayor is doing by, by re reaching out for the 9,000 number is also challenging the mayor surrounding us to do the same, to set a housing goal and work, work with us to meet the regional need. Um, but another piece of that is, um, when you build a new development area like Interbelt or Brick Bottom, if we don't put at least 30, 35% of that development as housing, what we're going to be creating is essentially office parks that are quiet and dead at 5 o'clock at like night. Like Kendall. Like, part, yes. part, part of Kendall. And, 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 and a lot of studies of what the office users are looking for right now is they're looking for mixed-use neighborhoods. They're looking to have places with day and evening activity. So we want to be competitive in the office market. The best way we can be competitive in the office market is by putting those offices in new neighborhoods that are mixed use that include housing, albeit don't go over the top because okay. housing is the most financially lucrative portion of the development to developers right now. If we just let it go, yeah, they'll build all housing. So And we'll have nothing for commercial tax base. That's why the mixed use the, 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 the special districts require a percentage of commercial as a part of the overall project. And that is a good segue. We have a couple minutes here, but in terms of Union Square and how that relates into Union Square, that's partly one of the reasons why US2 was hired as terms of the master developer to really overlay and take a look at all these neighborhoods and realize based on the new zone or maybe not, or their, their, their job is to kind of look at those types of mixed-use yes. developments. So what is the zoning overhaul? What does it mean to the US2 development team, which has been accelerating a lot of these neighborhood planning meetings? Will they have to adhere to it? That's a very good question. We are doing a neighborhood planning process for Union Square now. Um, we have some meetings coming up on Wednesday nights in February talking about technical issues about Union Square. We have a three-day on-site design charrette at the Somerville Post Office, the old post office mm -hmm. in Union Square on March um, 9th, 10th, 11th. Um, and we're building a plan for what the future of Union Square will be. And the US2 is helping us, but we're going beyond just US2's lots. Um, we are working collaboratively to figure that out. The zoning overhaul basically does a one-for-one -one translation of the districts from the zoning five years ago. So okay. where something was a, a, a five-story district before, it's a five-story district in the new code, where it was uh, 135 foot district before is the mixed use 10 story district in the new code. Um, but what I see is that the neighborhood plan lets us take another look at that and decide if we've got it right or not. Mm -hmm. And we can make some changes if we think, think it's wrong. And one of the changes we could do is we could adjust some of the boundaries if we include a neighborhood that, that it makes sense to adjust the boundaries. One of the other things we could do is we could look at creating one of the special districts like we yeah. did for Brick Bottom, which one of the advantages of is it would have a, um, a, a large scale development commercial development minimum yeah. so that ensures we get the commercial residential mix. So we're look all of those things are on the table. They're on the but table. They're necessarily in this overhaul package. So I didn't want to no, uh, overwhelm an people. You've already, I'm like, like, oh my God, there's, yeah, there's yeah. so much in here. <laughs> yeah. One of the things too, and then we probably should get going, is that I, the transitional zoning in terms of like Union Square, you know, we've got these really tall buildings slated, the uh, 10 MUs, and then there's the next door, you know, the neighbors next door. There's been a concern, a couple of, a couple of community members have said, you know, how are these, tra these areas, transitional areas, if you will? How can we assure that they're not going to be, you know, having a, a building topple over them? So we, we started to address this with the zoning we did five years ago in Union Square, where, where we had tall buildings that border on residential neighborhood district. It was a step up down, where you could step from certain, mm -hmm. certain um, heights down to the neighbors behind, behind them. Um, we actually have intensified that a bit more and actually made it more significant that if you border a residential, if you border a neighborhood resident district and you are a taller district, you have to address that edge by basically step stepping away from Stepping in, so it's not going to be such a... Houses. Um, that said, there are very few places where the 10-story and the 7-story district touch neighborhood residents. There are a That's lot where know. the 3, 4, and 5s do, okay. and, and particularly the 5 were very sensitive to making sure that, that, that step down works. Okay. And then as far as the um, design diversity and building types, I know you've done a lot to deal with the building types and all that, but, but in terms of the character of a neighborhood, um, is the design review committee still going to maintain? I mean, they don't really have a, an authoritative, I mean, they, they can recommend, but they don't have an authority. I mean, 
What is it the Urban Design Commission? What's the Urban so Design we Commission? The Design Review Committee, the Urban Design Commission. Okay. We wanted them to stay focused on um, the idea of how buildings interact with each other and, 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 and the community and the, the neighborhood around them. Uh, we named the Urban Design Commission. We have established that they will have a review process. Um, new development of any significant size will still end up in front of the Planning and the Zoning Board for, for a review. Um, in those cases, we're expecting um, that those uh, that we're going to continue to try to work to address the neighborhood issues. Um, what we are trying not to do, though, is use that process to reopen ideas of what building height and building yes. um, and building development intensity are. What I really need to know is if someone thinks the district next to them is too tall, we need to address yeah. that now in the, in the map. Um, but when an pro individual project comes in, the design and the process goes forward. Um, with a chance to mold the design of that project, mold the architectural design and do it in a collaborative process. Um, it's a need to understand that building forms, the building types specify basic building form, yeah. kind of a basic box of what yes. you're doing, but what they look like and what materials they use and how they interact with their neighbors and you know whether or not the trash is on one side yeah. or you know next to a neighbor or something like that or inside or outside all those things still need to be dealt with case by case but we could we could have a little bit more influence on that though right because i mean the design review committee doesn't well the, the urban committee now d uh, they're not going to really have any authority they're just going to recommend well they're going to recommend to the planning board or zoning board who still have the authority to control those, okay those i would just hope that yet you know with all this development going on everyone's excited about the new zoning code that you know that type of uh, oversight is happening in, in full force. It's very important um, to us. No, it's yeah. very important to me as well. So, give me one of the reasons why you think we've got we're over time. So that's okay because we're going to go up on YouTube. It's fine. Mm -hmm. um, why do you think it's so important for people to get involved? I think it's important for us to know and have feedback now as we make decisions that will affect how we're doing development and how we're implementing summer vision for the next, um, um, you know, for for the next few decades. Yeah. Um, and the most important thing to me is making sure that people get involved either by participating in the public hearing or at least stopping by the website and looking at the map and looking at the uh, code and yep. giving us your feedback. Um, we're very open to feedback. If you want to provide feedback on the website, you can do it right there. Um, if you're too shy to do that, you can send us an email at planning at summervillema.gov and we will look into all of that. And all that information will be on our blog, um, so you can check out our Greater Somerville blog. So I would like to thank our guest, George Parakis, for taking time out of his extremely busy schedule to come in and speak to us here at Greater Somerville about the newly submitted Somerville Zoning Overhaul document. While it is quite clear by our questions tonight that many issues have yet to be finalized, it is important to recognize and appreciate the hard work and dedication that this draft document took to create. And I would like to personally thank George, his entire staff, and the mayor for making this zoning vision one step closer to reality. Your passion and dedication year after year for making Somerville a better place to be is truly extraordinary. And I thank you very much for that. So I would encourage everyone to attend next Tuesday's meet public meeting, February 10th at 6 p.m. at City Hall and voice your opinions about the zoning overhaul document or visit the city's website and place your comment there. So that does it for us tonight. Thank you to the viewers at home for watching. Until next time, stay safe, stay informed, and go Patriots. Good night, everyone.